I apologize. It's it's kind of daunting to try to multitask like this. Um, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Morrison um, has a PhD in the Administration of Justice from the University of Southern Mississippi and completed in 20, uh, 2006. His dissertation was on parental alienation and is titled Parental Alienation Syndrome, an Inter-Ratter Reliable Study Alienating Behaviors Related Justice System Issues. He has been in law enforcement for over 45 years, working first on the Houston Police Department for 41 years and now as a captain in the Reserve Division of Harris County Precinct 4 Constable's Office. He is assigned to Training Division. He has an adjunct instructor for over 20 years and is presently adjunct teaching at the University of Houston downtown and Sam Houston University. Welcome Dr. Stephen Morris. Give me a quick second to pull up his presentation too. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come today and present the, the results of my study that I conducted during the year. Are we? No, I just want to get this off. Okay. <laughs> no, I can change just the arrow down. So I just was looking to see what you had done. So, all right. Um, my first slide that I put in place was a little bit about my background. She's already presented that to you. Um, picture there is me and my wife, and right now I'm raising a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old grandchildren. So, and that's part of parental alienation. My daughter um, is uh, made bad decisions in life, and so I, and as a result, I'm now the uh, taking care of two kids two grandkids. Um, first off, what are the five factors of the five-factor model? Wanted to go over that um, just a little bit. Uh, factor one is the child manifests contact resistance or refusal. Um, basically avoids a relationship with one of the parents um, or does the child avoid or refuse contact with one of the parents? Does the child avoid a relationship with one of the parents? Um, Amy Baker created the four-factor model in the beginning and along uh, William Burnett came along and added one more to it and thus we have the five-factor model now. <clears throat> Factor two, the presence of a prior positive relationship between the child and the now rejected parent. Uh, for this criterion, the uh, evaluator is asked to determine if there was a prior positive relationship between the child and, now, and the now rejected parent. Factor three, the absence of abuse, neglect, or serious deficient parenting on the part of the now rejected parent. And for this criterion, the evaluator is being asked to determine if there is true abuse, neglect, or if there is a serious deficient uh, parenting uh, to provide an answer of yes or no. <clears throat> and factor four, the use of the multi-alienating uh, behaviors on the part of the favored parent. Um, this is the 17 strategies that we have out there that uh, Amy Baker put together and created the list uh, that an alienating parent will use against the target parent. And then factor five are the eight manifest uh, behavioral manifestations uh, that exist in the child. Uh, these are the original um, behaviors that were put together by Gardner in his uh, beginnings as he addressed parental alienation as syndrome. <clears throat> All right, on my study, uh, I began in February and I sent out um, a little over, uh, well, it's 1,116 emails to potential respondents. Uh, those potential respondents were from the PASG group, um, the American Psychological Association, the Professional Academy of Custody Evaluators, and an internet search seeking child custody evaluators. <clears throat> what took place, there's 116. I had, when I came back out to do my second round of emails, uh, it was 739. So there's a reduction in the number of approaches that were made. That reduction was because they were bad email addresses. <clears throat> Continuing on, the respondents were sent a link. Um, basically, I had an email, and in the email, there were six different uh, stories. 
each of those stories had some parental alienation or none parental alienation. Uh, there were 12 demographic questions asked on the front side, the very first case that they were asked to take and look at. Um, and what's of interest is that is that 37% of those that responded to case one lived outside the U.S., thus supporting the aspect that this is a global issue and not just a U.S. issue. Uh, nine vignette questions were uh, also asked, so there was a total of 21 questions, and actually I'm asking in this study looking at the five questions of the five factors. <clears throat> Those vignettes, um, when I started my research uh, in the beginning looking for a topic to write on, um, my dissertation, I came across Carlos Ru Ruida's study, and he had done an iterator reliability study on PA. Uh, that was back in 2003, uh, and he published that in 2004. The vignette uh, contents, three of the cases had a valid symptom of PA. One of the cases presented some similarities with PA, but did not meet the criteria for PA. One case did not present any criteria for PA, and one additional vignette was added that contained rejection of one parent, but it was not due to alienating behaviors. And statistics on uh, reliability, uh, we looked at it from two different um, statistical techniques, interclass correlation coefficient, which is ICC, uh, zero is no agreement, one is absolute agreement. Um, a good reliability indicator is in the values of 0.75 to 0 0.90, where I have greater reliability if I'm above 0 0.90. For Cronbach Alpha, I'm looking for, again, 0.75 to 9, 0.95, which are, is an indicator of reliability. That's my response rate, and I put in there in the front side, the aggregate number was 250 uh, for case one, and you can kind of see it diminish in regards to the respondents. Uh, there were 61 that responded back for case one. For case two, there were 46, uh, continuing on downward, um, 40 uh, for case three, 37 for case four. For case five, there were 32, and for case six, there were 34. All right, and the Cronbach Alpha results, we're looking 4.75 to 0.95. You can see each of those values, uh, none of them drop below 0.75. And the, um, the lowest is 0.827, and the highest is 0.995. And then I have an average there of a 0.91, thus indicating that the five factors, uh, questions, asking those five questions, uh, if I have a good, um, mental health professional who understands what PA is when they go in and start asking those questions if they understand, then it is a tool that they can use to assist them in making a determination that PA may exist. I don't want to say absolute because we're humans and humans make mistakes. All right, the interclass correlation coefficient, uh, my lowest value there is 0.829. And my highest is, again, 0.995 with an average of 0.923. So both Cronbach Alpha and interclass correlation coefficients, the results of both of those uh, suggest that there's good reliability in using the five-factor model to determine if PA is occurring. All right, now I've got questions, so I'm short. I'll let you ask questions if you want to, and then I'll do my best. The mental health professionals that you had interview the, the children using the five-factor model, were they consistent with all of their interview methods and were they in line with like the forensic methodologies that we were, um, that were presented yesterday? I'm, I'm trying to understand a little bit of your question there, Sorry. what you're asking. <laughs> so you had said um, the, the mental health professionals, as they were interviewing the children, that's where you were getting your responses. Were they consistent in all of your criteria when? 
E each of the cases is a vignette, which is a story. So they were sent a story to review the story and determine from the story if PA existed. Okay. So there were six of those that were uh, utilized for this study. And five of those had been used before, uh, five used by Rurita and five used by me when I did my dissertation. And like I said, I used those five again and we added one more where um, the child rejected the parent, but it wasn't because of PA. So they weren't real? No, it wasn't real. And that's really kind of a limitation to this study is you don't have that opportunity to sit down and, and interreact. So there's some, this is, like I said, this is, and, and I don't like laboratory experiments. I like real things, field studies. But the problem is, is we can't get into that middle when we're doing, out there doing our uh, research. Yes? No, that, that would be of interest to go back and look and see. Well, but it was each of the vignettes had a little bit of a different story. So um, I was wondering, like, if there's a difference between the people that that did it based oh. upon you that came from the American Psych Association request or from the PASD. Uh, that, that would be of interest to go back and take a look at that and, and divide it in a little different way. But use what, the microphone. I'm sorry. What becomes a problem is, is I had 34 in my last case, so it won't give me a whole lot of information coming back. Was there um, any of the vignettes where factor one and maybe factor two weren't met because the, be, the PA behaviors were extreme, but they weren't successful, and would that be constitute PA? And they kind of get me to dig down into it and try to remember some of the the, the cases, I can't really tell you that personally right this minute as to which case had what particulars. Um, it is, it's written up in my paper if you want to go back and get the paper. Uh, or you get my email address down there on the bottom. You can send me an email and I'll communicate with you that way if you want to do that. Hey, <clears throat> sorry, I may have missed this, but uh, with, with the six cases that you presented and you had very high inter-rater reliability, you had a very high agreement, which is great. Yes. Um, but what I may have missed is, was PA ostensibly present in all six cases or were you looking at no. discriminant? Okay. Yeah, there were varying levels of uh, activity that might would suggest PA was occurring. Maybe one of them had uh, one of the 17 or maybe one had uh, one of the eight manifest behaviors. So it was all broke up that way. One more. And my uh, co-researcher with me, she had some uh, medical emergency for some of her family, so that's the reason why it's me up here today by myself. Thank you. This is a um, little bit of a comment with a question, and that is, uh, my comment is that I find um, in practice working with um, GALs, sometimes they conceptually understand parental alienation, but then when, it, when they're dealing with real life people and seeing someone that may be using alienating behaviors, I sense that they have almost a professional cognitive dissidence to not want to accept that this person is, is alienating the child. And um, so um, I'm just, it, the question for you and for future research would be maybe to try to identify that, where leaning, reading a clinical vignette, they kind of get it really good. But then in real life, they really struggle to accept that you know this is going on with some people in front of them. Yeah, I could understand that, yes. Got one more in the back. And I think one of the things I do need to make sure that we all understand, this is a tool to use, and that when you get through uh, asking the five questions and you get a yes for each of those, that doesn't necessarily mean that PA is occurring, because you, the evaluator, may not know all of the nuances or have a good understanding of what PA is. So it's important that you use it as a tool and not as an absolute that PA is in existence. Go ahead. I just wanted to make a comment. So I'm, I'm a court-involved therapist, and I work with guardians a lot. And um, some of the older, old school, I would call them, um, when you start identifying a problem, they say, well, the way we handle it is if 
one person's going to get punished, the other one's going to get punished too. And we always are equal, and that's just how it's done. And it's like, I understand we don't want to be biased, and we don't want to be mean. But when it actually comes to application, sometimes if you've got a perpetrator, you know, um, can we do something? And so it always feels like there's this culture of, well, you can't ever identify anybody, because then you're just playing wrong or something you know what I mean like you're being bad or critical when it's like then you're in a bind like what if the children are being hurt you kind of have to call somebody out but we do give them a billion chances like way above and beyond what anybody the patience that it takes and here's another chance and how about another chance how about co-parenting counseling and and I understand exactly what you're saying because it actually aligns itself with um our criminal justice system and law enforcement because when we're out there sometimes we've got our mind made up when we see something and we don't give that opportunity for them to tell tell us the whole story we need to sit back and and listen instead of jumping to conclusions on the front side I understand what you're saying good okay <laughs>